think, you know, it's two times pi times like the deviation divided by the width of the channel divided by the sample rate or something like that. It's already populated in there. All you have to do is populate those constants and that value gets filled out. And we know what the constants are because we got it out of the docs. And then step three, clock recovery looks really scary. Four of those five variables in there are the GNU radio constants. And the only one that has been updated is uh, the first one, omega, which is mapped to a variable that you can just replace. And that is gonna correlate the, the rate of the input data to the, out, to the symbol rate that we're expecting. And we're gonna release this so you'll be able to take this and apply it to other FSK signals you see. So at this point, we have bits, we've gotten, we've gotten bits, we've solved the radio part, and we have bits you know, in our computer that we can work with with any tool that we want. So here's some pseudocode. I have it implemented in Python that I'll show you in just a minute. But ultimately, we're gonna do the process that we talked through earlier. We're gonna look for the preamble and start a frame delimiter, uh, that header information in, the, in the, the signal that we're seeing to, to identify that we're about to receive a packet. Then once we're synchronized, we're gonna read out the bits, de-Manchester encode them, and then parse them out. Um, so it's time for a quick little demo. Uh, again, all these tools are going to be released, so you'll be able to look through them in greater detail. But basically, I'm firing up my GNU radio flow graph here in GRC. Same thing I just showed you. And then over in this uh, shell, I'm going to run my uh, Python decoder. And I've got the device plugged in down here. I'll create some traffic, and you'll see some, uh, see some frames. So there we go. Again, we don't really care what the information in the application layer is. We really just want to show that we can get information out of, out of, out of, this, RF fi, out of this wireless FI just by doing a little bit of open source information and being able to fill in the gaps. All right, so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Mark. So now we'll take a look at another low complexity physical layer. In this case, it's with this wireless doorbell and we're looking at the Heath Zenith SL7762. And the way this works, you have a receiver, which is this uh, box here, which has some batteries and a radio receiver and a speaker in it. And then you have a transmitter, which is this doorbell button. And so you press the button, it sends a packet to the doorbell, and then it plays this chime. The doorbell button itself, or the doorbell itself, comes with two buttons, so you have two buttons that can play two different chimes. Uh, because the chime is receive only, it doesn't actually transmit, it doesn't need to go through the same FCC certification process. So in this case, we only have a FCC ID for the doorbell button, but we can start our open source intelligence there. So we pull up the FCC exhibits for this doorbell button, and we have a lot of irrelevant stuff, but we also have this test report, which contains these RF characteristics as identified by the test lab. So we pull up the test report, and we look in the product description section here, and we can see right away that this is a 315 megahertz center frequency. So already we know some of the channel information about this device. Further down of the test report, we have this discussion of pulse desensitization. And we see here that we have a 320 microsecond duration bit one. And this tells us some interesting information, which is that this is likely going to be a pulse width modulation. And this is a type of on-off keying or amplitude shift keying where we're encoding data based on how long the transmitter remains on. So this is telling us that to communicate a bit one, the doorbell button is going to turn its radio on for 320 microseconds and then turn off. Down here, we can infer that we have a 13-bit packet length. We have this equation which says 0.32 times 5 plus 0.72 times 8. So we can see that we have five one bits in the packet that the test lab looked at. And then we can infer that the 0.72 refers to the duration of the bit zero. And then we would have eight zero bits in this example packet. So now we know the duration of the bit one, duration of the bit zero, as well as the total number of bits in the packet. Down here we see that it's a 25 millisecond duration or packet spacing. And this is telling us something interesting, which is that either we have a large spacing between each one and zero, or that we have a packet that's transmitted followed by some predefined gap. And so that gives us a 30% duty cycle, meaning when you are actively operating the doorbell button, it is only transmitting from the radio 30% of the time. So this is an image from further on in the test report, and this is a time domain visualization of a single packet. So on the x-axis, we have time, and on the y-axis, we have power. And this lines up with the information we saw from earlier in the test report, where we had these 13 vertical bars, each representing one bit. So the leftmost bar is a skinny bar. This is going to be a 300 microsecond bit one, followed by a 700 microsecond bit zero. And we can see from the legend on the bottom there that each bit is approximately one millisecond in duration. 
So that tells us that for a bit one, we're going to have the radio off for 700 microseconds and on for 300. And for a bit zero, we're going to have the radio off for 300 microseconds and on for 700. And the problem is we don't actually know yet what these bits mean. And there wasn't any further data in the test report from this particular doorbell. Uh, but looking through the FCC documentation, I found an older doorbell from the same manufacturer, and it has some good information here. And this says the data rate is approximately one kilohertz, and the pattern consists of eight address bits, four data bits, and one start bit, which gives us 13 bits total. And this lines up with what we've seen, so we can assume that this packet format will apply to our doorbell as well. So that means we're going to have this one kilohertz data rate, we'll have an eight bit address, which we can assume is the unique identifier of the doorbell button, and then we'll have a four bit data section. And because the doorbell button can transmit different tones, we can assume that that four bits is going to represent an identifier for the specific tone. So now we can do a sanity check, and we can actually pull up uh, Bob Line, the spectrum visualization tool using GNU Radio. So this is uh, you know, kind of a bare minimum simple flow graph. We have our USRP source, which is our software defined radio, and that is simply sending data into Bob Line. And we can see in this image here on the right, this is the visualization of the doorbell button. So we have you know, 13 bits here. We have the skinny one bits and the wide long bits, or wide zero bits. So this tells us that the OSINT information we have matches up with what we're seeing over the air. And in this case, I ended up getting a couple of these doorbell sets, looked at the four different doorbell buttons, and everything lines up. So we have the start of frame bit, we have the button ID, and then we have the tone ID. And so from OSINT alone in this case, we've learned enough information to actually implement a transceiver and a receiver. So we've learned the channel, which is a 315 megahertz center frequency. We've learned that it's pulse width modulation. We've got the symbol timing, which is this one kilohertz data rate. We know what a bit zero looks like and a bit one. We've been able to synchronize the packets by determining the packet format, which is the start bit, the button ID, and the tone ID. So we can take this information and then actually implement some simple GNU Radio Python code to interact with this doorbell. And depending on your level of comfort, some people like using GNU Radio Companion and doing flow graphs. I prefer to work in code. Uh, so this is just a Python example. You have the class here called a top block. This is just some GNU Radio nomenclature. Uh, we have our USRP source here. This is just a software-defined radio instance. We run that through a low-pass filter. We then have these next two blocks here which tell us the output power. And so what we're doing is we are saying, telling the software to find radio to record this data, and then we're computing the decibel power of this doorbell button because we care about, you know, is a transmitter turned on or off? Then we have this threshold block which will output either a bunch of ones or a bunch of zeros depending on whether or not the doorbell button is above or below a certain threshold. So this gives us a bit stream that tells us whether or not the doorbell is transmitting or is turned off. We can then send those bits into this doorbell framer class, and this is just some simple logic to look for that packet format. And so again, because we have a bit one represented by um, 700 microseconds of the radio transmitter being off and 300 microseconds being on, we know that we're going to have a period of a low level followed by a period of a high level and then followed by a period of low level. And so when we see that low to high to low transition, we know we've seen a bit. So after we see that transition, we look to see how long the transmitter was high. We say if it is 400 microseconds or less, we call it a bit one, otherwise we call it a bit zero. And then when we've received 13 bits, we know we have a packet, and so we can pack eight of those bits into the button ID and four of those bits into the tone ID, and then we can print this out to standard out. So I'll go and run this script here and we'll decode the packet from this doorbell. Okay, so we can see that we have uh, button ID 249 and tone ID 1. Now in this case, because it's a very simple protocol, we can do the inverse pretty easily. So I have a transmitter script here, and we start with a tone, just a simple you know, cosine wave, and without modifying this, we just send this wave to the radio, and then it's always going to be transmitting. So we need to modulate this somehow and turn it on or off. And the easiest way to do that is just multiply this generated signal with some ones or zeros. So we have a mask here for bit zero, which is just 300 microseconds worth of zeros and 700 microseconds worth of ones. And then for bit one, we have 700 microseconds worth of zeros and 300 microseconds worth of ones. And then to generate our packet mask, we take an input button ID and just concatenate a bunch of these bit zero and bit one masks together to make this packet mask. And then we can multiply this mask by this automatically generated cosine wave and mimic the transmission of this doorbell button. So we'll go here and pass this into the doorbell transmitter script. 
So we have button ID 249 and tone one that we received from this. And now we've transmitted that using the SDR and shown that we can actually inject packets into the doorbell. And so I've noticed in the So in the hotel, some of the rooms have these doorbells on the door. Um, if you are in one of these rooms, come find me. I really want to be your friend. <laughs> and so now let's look at another common device, in this case, a wireless keyboard. And we're going to be looking at the HP Classic Wireless Desktop Keyboard. And this is a keyboard and mouse set, but we're only going to be looking at the keyboard and dongle. Um, so this is actually manufactured by an OEM called Acrox. It's an HP product. And because we have three distinct devices here, we have three distinct FCC IDs. And so we can start by looking at the FCC test report for the dongle. And we can see that it's GFSK modulation, one megabit per second data rate, and 78 channels. So we have a pretty good start here. Now we have the keyboard test report. Now this gives us some different information, which is kind of problematic. So we can still see the FSK modulation, which lines up. But this says a two megahertz channel bandwidth and 34 channels. So this is kind of confusing. And the channel bandwidth of two megahertz is not necessarily incompatible with a one megabit data rate. So we're going to assume that the data rate indicated by the dongle is correct. And then because this is a device we can plug into a computer, we can also get some information by plugging the dongle in and looking at the D message output. Here we see that it says the manufacturer is Mozart Semiconductor. So this is a case where we have a product with a brand on it that's made by some OEM with electronics by some other company. And so the OSINT has failed us a little bit and we need to break out the radio. So we can start by plugging the dongle in and looking across the spectrum using new radio and bot line. And we see something interesting, which is that the dongle is camping on a single channel for the entire time. It's not doing any kind of popping. It's only using one channel. So regardless of the different channel number counts in the different test reports, we can throw that out because we know it's operating on one channel. And we can also see that it's probably some kind of time division multiple access. The dongle is transmitting these packets every eight milliseconds, and so we can infer that the keyboard and mouse will probably time synchronize to that and then transmit in other slots on that channel. So now we can do some typing on the keyboard, and this validates what we've inferred. And so we see that the dongle is transmitting these packets every eight milliseconds. When we're typing actively, the keyboard then, packets, or keyboard then transmits its packets two milliseconds after each dongle packet. And so now we can actually use the information we've gathered to start to decode some data. So we'll start with the SDR source, go into our low-pass filter, do the demodulation, pack these bits into bytes, and then write it to disk. And what's going to happen, we'll press play, and then this GNU radio flow graph will demodulate the channel that the keyboard and dongle exist in and save that to disk. Then we can operate it on disk like we would any other binary format. And I really like to use existing command line tools for doing this kind of thing. So we know that a lot of wireless protocols will start with a preamble of alternating ones or zeros, or all ones or all zeros. And so we can start with a capture of the dongle and pass this into the XXD utility, which will give us a hex dump of the data. And then we can just grab for stuff that looks like it might be a packet. So we look for repeating ones and zeros, and then we look for the next four bytes in the packet, which might be a sync word or header or so forth. And then we just sort by what is commonly found. And then we get this nice byte sequence from the dongle. So we know that this is something transmitted by the dongle. But what we actually care about is what the keyboard is sending. So we do another capture where we record data from the dongle while also typing on the keyboard. And then we can just use sed to get rid of that sequence that we associated with the dongle. We can run this um, grep command again on the sanitized keyboard data. And we have this new sequence. So we can infer that this is related to packets sent by the keyboard. And so now we can grep for that sequence and what follows, and we find that we have some repeated sequences that are likely going to be the different keys I was typing on the keyboard. And now you can use your normal um, protocol and packet format reverse engineering tools and skills to figure out what this is. And so it turns out that we have you know, preamble, an address, a sequence number, a frame type, in this case just a keyboard packet. Then we have the actual keystroke identifying the key that was typed, and a CRC. And so the point here is that we've used very, very little radio stuff. We've dragged and dropped you know, five or six blocks into GNU Radio Companion. We've done some open source intelligence and done some regular binary format analysis. And we've barely touched a radio and have been able to completely reverse engineer the packet format for this wireless device. And to really bring this home, the nice thing about this uh, space is that people much smarter than me have built some great tools that allow you to leverage all of their expertise and treat this as any other software or um, regular binary reverse engineering problem. Okay, so to tie it all together, uh, we've proposed this methodology. 
and we've shown by looking at a series of three phi's that this can be applied to just about every, um, every low complexity IoT protocol that's out there. We've also shown that by leveraging open source intelligence, we're able to skip all the hard parts uh, so that we can get to a point where we can use the skills that we already have to work through these binary formats. So we've shown that all three phi's have some representation of a channel. Modulation is where they deviate the most, but we, again, we can leverage open source intelligence to, to, to make this uh, easier for us. They all have some timing information that has to be recovered. They all contain synchronization features of varying complexity, but things that we can use to start to identify the start of a packet and parse it out. Uh, and then finally, once you get to this point, as we've shown, we're just dealing with bits on a disk here. And you can use the skills that you already have as reverse engineers, as software developers, as people who know how, how computer networks work to figure out what these uh, binary formats mean. So we can repeat this process for any low complexity phi that we might encounter. So just to wrap up, we've shown that these disparate wireless systems can be rationalized and understood by using process. And we can leverage uh, open source information that's out there uh, to make the really domain specific and hard, challenging parts of working with radios easy. Uh, such that once we demodulate, we're left with bits that we can handle with any tools we, we please. Um, so one last thought to leave you with, um, just to you know, inspire you as you go charging out the doors. The IoT is not gonna pwn itself. Um, actually, it already has. Um, it's on you now to develop the radio decoders to, to start to listen to these devices, find these vulnerabilities, and tell the world. Uh, so with that, thank you for your attention. Uh, we'll be happy to take any questions with whatever time we have left. I've just been informed we're out of time, so Mark and I will be <laughs> Mark and I will be happy to hang out uh, in the hallway and chat with you guys for as long as you'd like. Thank you again. Oh, the text? Yeah, I'm not, yeah, that's fine. <laughs>
Yes, I do. Excellent. He's on his way over with the traffic signal. Awesome. <laughs> um, so what would you look at me? Straight up is good. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite bright. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have a lot of computer to set up. Okay. Well, I'll get out of your way. Um, but yeah, basically, your timing people are right there. Okay. Awesome. Do you uh, give us a I am. Uh, and it works. I mean, do you want to? Should I start the video? I would, I would give it one. Oh, so oh, we need audio, don't we? Do you have an audio cable? Here, should be. Uh, we have one demo that you can share with you. Because of his excellent advice to put the cable in the hole that looks like the cable. Yep, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty good. That's it's a high bar to get on this page. Oh, it just crashed. Yeah.